let's take a look at how to display quantitative data. Again, this first slide is just an overview, so I'm not going to talk a lot about this. I'm just going to give this basically as a handout, as a quick reference, so that you remember which is which, and obviously which displays are appropriate for quantitative data. The data that we're using for this video, again, is in our Chapter 2 data spreadsheet. We're going to reuse our 3D TV prices. We're also going to look at ACT scores and CPI. The first display is a histogram, and this looks very similar to the bar graphs or bar charts that we were just looking at for our qualitative data. It is similar because it does show how frequently each range of values occurs. However, because the data is quantitative, the big difference here is this axis is a number line and it's a continuous number line. And so it makes sense that this value would be 1500 and this value would be 1600 and this value would be 1700. And so this bar represents from 1500 to 1599. And this next bar is from 1600 to 1699. So if you joined us for our previous video where we use this data, we had created uh, the frequency distribution using all of those values. So that's the real big difference between the two. In terms of how to label your horizontal axis, which is the number line, I'm totally fine with you keeping the range of values that includes the lower class limit and the upper class limit. Um, often Hawks will also ask you to find, say, the class midpoint or class boundary. Um, but for me, you can use the entire range. So I have our 3D TV prices data. And again, I'm going to create our histogram from that. And I'm going to show you how to do this using a pivot table. So you might be saying, uh, I, know, I already know how to do this and I don't have to make a pivot table. And that's true. Um, but obviously I'm teaching you this class and in this class part of your project is to a first create a pivot table and then B create a histogram from that pivot table so that's the method I'm going to show you so yes there are other ways to create a histogram I'm going to show you using a pivot table so I've highlighted the data I'm going to go to insert and I'm going to choose a pivot table now I can also choose pivot chart and if you'll notice, if I choose pivot chart and pivot table, again, same, same rigmarole, we're going to choose our data. We're going to choose the existing worksheet and where we want that information to go and then click OK. So just as I did before, I'm going to take 3D TV prices and move it to both the axis and the values. And I'm going to change this to value field settings and count. And if I'm going too quickly for you through this part of it, just keep in mind that we've already done this in our frequency uh, distribution video 2.1. So pretty much I have everything I need here. The great thing about this is notice it's already creating my histogram for me. The only thing I haven't done yet is to right click and click on group. Remember here, we unchecked this box because we had decided we were going to go from 1500 and then go by 100s. And so if you'll notice, the only thing I have to do for my pivot table is get rid of that blank value. And then for my histogram, I'm missing a little bit. So what's wrong with my histogram? Well, I have I'm going to scroll over here a little bit and make this a little bit smaller. So what I have is all of the bars, but if you'll notice, the bars aren't touching. So if I double click on the bar, I can go to gap width and take it to zero. Again, I can go and vary colors by point, so it's just a little bit prettier. And then this is where we are determining how to label each bar. So it's going to label it however you have it labeled here. Um, I have this as 1500 to 1599, and that's what's happening here. If I had changed this to uh, 1549.5, then that's going to automatically change there. 
Again, for my purposes, we are going to leave it as 1500 to 1599. Why mess with something that's not broken? Again, you would change the t uh, title and you would go to that little plus and add the access titles so that everything that is necessary was included. In this case, I probably wouldn't keep this legend because I have all of these values down here and it's just taking up a lot of room. And so again, change the total uh, title, which is total, change the access title and change the access title. And then you have everything you would need for your pivot table and histogram. I added two different displays to this slide because honestly, they're not things that you're going to see very, uh, very often. We have a frequency polygon and an ogive, which again, a frequency polygon is essentially graphing the midpoint and connecting the midpoint of each class um, with straight lines. And an ogive is a line graph that depicts the cumulative frequency. So we talked about that in section 2.1 as well, the cumulative frequency up to the total value of n, which in this case was 20. Again, you're probably not going to see these very often, so I didn't want to spend any time on them. The next display is a stem plot, or also called a stem and leaf plot. And it's similar to a histogram because when you're done, you'll end up with things that sort of look like bars um, horizontally instead of vertically. The advantage to this is that it does retain the actual data values, whereas a histogram just shows a bar and it doesn't show the individual values. Um, it's a little bit time consuming to make by hand. It's even more time consuming if you'll imagine to make using Excel. So we're just going to create one by hand. Um, it's very helpful when you're making one of these to actually have your data from least to greatest, um, but we don't have that. So we're just going to go with it. So stem and leaves. What we're going to do is you want to find the lowest value and you want to find the greatest value. And that's going to help you determine what your stems will be. So it looks like my lowest is 17 and my greatest is 35. Now, the only thing I need that for is that tells me that my first stem is going to be one and I'm going to use all the stems in between till I get to three. From here, I'm going to look at anything that begins with a one. So here's an 18, an 18, a 17, a 19, and an 18. So I'm going to um, write down the ones digit for each of those. So for 17, I'm going to write just a seven. Now notice I'm only writing the seven because it's connected to a stem of one. Then I have an 18 and an 18 and an 18 and a 19 and that's all of those values. Now let's do the same for a stem of two. So here's a value that starts with two. And again, this is why it's helpful to have your array ordered because then you don't have to worry about trying to determine which one goes next. So 20 is the smallest. And when you're um, entering in these values, again, 21 is next. Notice I'm trying to line up the zero right below the seven and the one right below the eight, because that's what gives us um, the, the correct proportions. Uh, I think there's a 22 in here, maybe. No, 22. And then a 23. And a 24. And a 24. And a 25. And a 26. And I'm writing too big <laughs> and a 26 and a 27 and a 27 and a 29. Oh, almost didn't make it. Now let's look at the 30s. So I have a 35, a 31, a 32. So that's one, two, five. Now here's why this can be helpful. If you kind of turn your head to the side, you can think about this kind of like a histogram and you can see how long the bars are in relation to one another. 
Another way that this could be helpful is if, again, you had two different distributions. Quite often you'll see um, leaves on one side and then leaves on the other side as well. So say if we were um, looking at you know, junior test scores for the ACT versus senior test scores for the ACT, you could have a nice visual of the difference between those two distributions. A dot plot is another way that you can retain the data values, and by that, again, I mean I can look at the graph and say that there was 117 and 318s and so on. And this one, again, not used very often um, and not, uh, not easy to make using Excel. So again, for each data value, and actually I'm just going to start at the beginning, and for each data value I'm just going to put a dot above that, so 27. 35, 18, and again I'm stacking them, so notice when I had that second 18 I left a little bit of space, and then 23. So again as I look at this dot plot you can again think of this kind of like a histogram where this has just one in frequency, this has three, this has one, and so forth. So again, not one that you use very often because it's only as good as the person making it unless you're using technology. Um, but it is, again, another way that retains the original data. The last graph that I want to look at with you for quantitative data is the line graph. Now the line graph is very specific on when you can use it you are going to show changes over time. So whenever you're making a line graph, one of your variables should be time. So days, minutes, years, months, whatever time um, value that you're looking at, that should be the horizontal axis and the vertical axis should be whatever it is that you are taking a look at. In this case, consumer price index. Let's take a look at how we can do this in Excel. So we're using our CPI by year data. And again, the important thing here is that year is listed first. If it's not listed first, it just you can still do it, but it takes longer. So it's just easier to make sure year is first. So I'm highlighting everything and I'm going to the insert tab and I'm going to choose the scatter plot option. I'm going to choose that second one because that's going to give me not just the dots, but also um, the line that connects them and I don't want it to be without the dots so I'm going to choose that second one and again we're then going to add whatever we need so just as before I can change the chart title I can add the axis titles and include what is necessary there I can add the data labels if I want so play around with those different options but you can see exactly what can be added um, to your graph to make sure that it is giving the full story. Coming up next, we're going to finish up chapter two by analyzing graphs.